Praise the Lord. Before I begin preaching from God's Word today, I'd like to give another testimony. Once again, sometimes the testimonies can be more of a blessing than the sermon itself. So before hearing this sermon, I'd like to give a testimony. Let us turn our Bible to the book of Matthew chapter 10. In the book of Matthew chapter 10. In verse 16. The Lord Jesus Christ who commands us to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature also says this in Matthew chapter 10 verse 16. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. When we obey the Lord Jesus Christ to go into all the world and to preach the gospel of every creature, we must remember the words of Christ who says that he sends us forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. And what are we to do about that? Hide from them? Are we to hide from the wolves and be fearful? No. We are to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Back in the year 2001, the Lord sent me to a slum area community of shacks and slum houses on Sukhavit Soy 1. Or actually, it's parallel to Sukhavit Soy 1 in between the, the tollway and Sukhavit Soy 1 at the railroad tracks. There's a huge slum area. And in 2001, the Lord sent me that slum area to preach the gospel as it was a complete area given over to the drug of methamphetamines, otherwise known as Yaba, the crazy drug, here in Thailand. It's methamphetamines in pill form. People can swallow it, they can smoke it, they can break it down and inject it and do all sorts of things with methamphetamines. And in 2001, that community was completely given over to that drug. In fact, drugs are an epidemic around the world, especially in this third world country of Thailand. They say that over 60% of the people of Bangkok, just in the city of Bangkok alone, over 60% are addicted to methamphetamines. And then 2001, as I, was, or meth, as I was preaching the gospel there at that slum area, a missionary from America joined me. Now many of these missionaries from America, the first world, do not get to experience what life is like on the third world. Yes, they may move here to the third world, but they bring their first world civilized living with them. They live in very nice houses, they drive very nice vehicles, they preach in very nice churches, or very nice Bible schools, and they shop at the nicest shopping centers and the nicest grocery stores. We know of some missionaries up in Chiang Mai, Thailand, who though in America they live simple lives, on the mission field they live in the richest neighborhood in Chiang Mai, Thailand, off the mission money. You see, they bring their first world with them to the third world, and they're completely blind to the realities of life for those of us who live here and grew up here in the third world. Jesus Christ commands us to go into the world and to preach the gospel of every creature. Though many missionaries come here from their other countries, such as America, or the West, or civilized countries, when they get to the mission field, they don't go out into the world. They just preach in churches and conferences or in Bible schools and do not go into the world and are blind of what life is like here in the third world. Well, this American missionary joined me and his eyes are open to what life is like in those slums, especially people are addicted to such a terrible drug as methamphetamines, which is ruining their lives. And as we preach the gospel there, that American missionaries are wondering, where are all the Christians? Where are all his missionary friends? Why don't they come to places such as this? And then he, in turn, never came out with me again after that. But then he would boast to the other missionaries about joining me and preaching in such an area as that. Praise the Lord. And this is a reason why Thailand continued to remain less than 1% Christian. Less than 1% of the population of this country of Thailand profess Christianity. And though missionaries come in from all over the world, they do not go into the world. They're in their church buildings, 
They're in their Bible schools. They're living their nice lives and their nice fancy shopping centers. And they're not preaching the gospel into the world, which they're receiving money to do so. So as we go forth and preach the gospel, the Lord says He sent us for the sheep in the midst as sheep in the midst of wolves, and that we're to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. 2017. That community on Sukhumit Soy One has never been cleaned up. Drugs are still an epidemic here in Thailand. And now in that community, for all these years, you have children who have grown up in that drug addicted community to parents who are drug addicts. They did not get a chance to get a nice education, therefore they cannot get good jobs. They grew up parents as drug addicts. They've grown up left to themselves. They weren't trained up by parents. They have tattoos all over their bodies. They don't know manners as parents were not able to train them as they were drug addicted. And now these children have grown up in drugs themselves. And they're on Sukhavit Road, where that slum is. You have some of the nicest hotels. Just across the street from Sukhavit Soy Wine, you have the JW Marriott. Filled with diplomats from around the world and leaders around the world saying it's such a nice hotel such as that. And you have all sorts of nice hotels right there in Sukhumit Road where the slum area is. And tourists, with all their tourist money, they're on Sukhumit Road. Also in the same neighborhood on Sukhumit Soy 3, in between Soy 3 and Slash 1, you have the Bumlungrad Hospital which is up to international standards, and people from around the world, especially the Middle East, will go to that hospital and spend their wealthy money to get such nice medical care here in Thailand. So then those children from that slum area who have no opportunities in life, who are not able to get jobs, not able to go to school, grow up addicted to drugs, they have become thieves. At the same time here in Bangkok, Thailand, the government's cleaned the roads up from street vendors. I've lived here since 1990. I grew up there on Sukhavit Road. I went to high school on Sukhavit Road. And the first boxing gym I trained at was on Sukhavit Road as well. I grew up on Sukhavit Soy 31. The boxing gym I trained at was on Sukhavit Soy 36 at the Sarchit Lada Camp. That was the first gym I started off with. And then high school went to the ISB was on Sukhavit Soy 15. And I've grown up with street vendors on Sukhavit Road all these years until now, this year, the government's cleaned the road of street vendors. In order to get the street vendors off the road, they have turned off the street lights. Because the street vendors who need lights for their vendors would wire in right to the government street lights and use the electricity for free for their street vendors. So in order to keep those street vendors off the road, they've turned off all the street lights on the side of Sukhav Road, except for the middle of Sukhav Road. So the road, if you're driving vehicles, is lit up, because the street lights in the middle are turned on, but on the side of the road, on the sidewalks, it's completely dark with no street lights on, as the government has turned off all the street lights. Now all those criminals and thieves in the slum areas, on the streets, in the dark, dressed in black, as everybody is now at this time in Thailand, dressed in black, are preying upon the people. But Christ sends us forth as sheep in the midst of wolves with this command, to be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We are there for a reason. We are there to convert the loss, to convert wolves into sheep. We're preaching the gospel in the streets, not so that people around the world can see what we're doing. We're preaching to those people on the streets. We have a heart's desires for souls to be saved, as it is written in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 15, verse 7. The Lord Jesus Christ says, I say unto you that likewise joy should be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. We are preaching not to the church. We're preaching not to the choir. Why must we say this? Because many full-time paid missionaries, and today we're going to beat up on the missionaries, 
are preaching only in church buildings, are preaching only to the choir, are preaching only in Bible schools or in conferences filled with the Christians and not preaching to the lost, those that need to come to repentance. And that's why we're out on these streets. For what reason? For the lost to be saved. We are praying, P-R-E-Y-I-N-G, on the predators. And what are we praying upon the predators for? For their lost souls. To bring them to repentance. Christ sent us forth to bring those lost souls to repentance. As is written in the book of Jeremiah. I'm not going to find the scripture offhand at this moment. But then Jeremiah, the Lord says, you're going to send out fishers and hunters. And that's what we are. We are fishers of men, as Christ says once again in the book of Matthew. We're actually turning to Luke. Luke chapter 5. Verse 10, it is written, And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which are part of the Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Christ has sent us, sends us forth as fishers of men to catch men, to save the lost, to save souls. We pray, P-R-E-Y, upon these predators, these wolves, we pray upon them to win their lost souls, to bring them unto repentance. For our God does the impossible, as it is written in the book of Mark. Mark chapter 9, verse 23. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. We believe in God's word. We believe the gospel of Christ which is preached in God's word. We believe the gospel of Christ is the power of God, the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. And as faith in the works is dead, because we believe this gospel is preached from this word, God's word, we believe souls can be saved, Therefore, we preach this gospel for our souls to be saved, as it is the power of the salvation to everyone that believeth. So on this past Wednesday night, after preaching that gospel in the intersection, until my voice ran out, though there wasn't that many souls now, as it's the Mohammedan month of fasting, in which they call Ramadan, so most of the visitors in the Middle East were not here in Thailand now. They're back in their home country in the Middle East celebrating Ramadan. As we're preaching the gospel, praise God, souls are the gospel nonetheless. Many gospel tracks went out. And after we finished preaching the gospel, after I finished preaching my voice out, we walked down to that area in which the people of the slum come out to pray upon, P-R-E-Y, pray upon those who are unsuspecting of their criminal activities. There's a reason why I give out tracts where I give out tracts to. There's a reason why I walk where I walk when I preach the gospel. And as we're there in that dark sidewalk, I notice at a bus stop, because the government turned off all the streetlights on the sidewalks, that bus stop now is completely dark, filled with many people from offices, hotels, tourists. There at that bus stop, I saw a man in the shadows dressed in black. Looking upon, looking upon those at that bus stop. I saw him as a predator. By the grace and love of God, I've been doing the work of an evangelist full time for the past over 20 years. I've been on the streets around the world preaching the gospel for the past over 20 years, 22 years to be exact. And as we preach the gospel so long the streets, we know who the predators are, as Christ has given us a warning and a command. 
a warning that sends us forth as sheep in the midst of wolves, and a command to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. When we're out in the streets, we know who the wolves are. We know who the predators are. Also, out in the streets, as with any form of combat, you must always be aware of your surroundings. In fact, 80% of combat is won if you know your surroundings. When you get two boxers in the ring, the boxer is a good foundation and knows how to use the ring to his advantage is a boxer who is 80% of the time going to win the boxing match. When it comes to war, those who know the terrain and know the area will 80% of the time win every battle and the war itself. You must know your surroundings when you're out on these streets in which Christ says that he's going to send us forth as sheep in the midst of wolves to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. You need to know your surroundings. You need to know who is around you. You need to know where you're at all the time. That's why I don't agree with those people using their phones on a public like that. If you're going to use your phone, go find somewhere private where you can sit down in the security of a building, whether it be a coffee shop or restaurant, or even back here at home, but not up there in public. Because you must always be wary of your surroundings because Christ has given to us a warning that he sends us for the sheep in the midst of wolves with a command to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. You've got to keep your eyes open. And there in the shadows of that bus stop, I saw this young man praying upon the people. Praying, P-R-E-Y-N-G, as he was a predator, as he was a wolf. But little did he know, I was praying upon him, because we desire for those lost souls to be saved. So as he was in the shadows, look at all those in the bus stop, who he's going to steal from, who he's going to rob from, I was in the shadows as well behind him, watching him watch them. And as I walked up behind him, as I make no noise when I walk, I stood behind him with the Gospel of John of the Thai tongue. And when he perceived and felt there was a presence behind him, he looked and saw me dressed in black in the shadows with the Gospel of John to give to him. He jumped and loud out a scream. How come? He asked me to sit down with him and told me his story. Years prior, he used to have a girlfriend, a Thai woman, who was a Mohammedan, or what they call Muslims. And as she was a Mohammedan, she desired for him, her boyfriend at the time, to convert to the religion of Mohammedism, or what's now known as Islam. And this man, who was in love with this girl, and she, they wanted to get married, so they have to convert to Islam or Mohammedism, she began teaching him that in the religion of Islam or Mohammedism, you must fear their God, what they call Allah, that he sees you all the time. Well, for this Buddhist man, this was something new he'd ever heard before. Because in Buddhism, your idols are at the temple. And Buddhism, your idols hang around your neck, and when you decide to sin, like I used to do before I was a Buddhist, you take your idol off your neck, you bow to it, you hang it up on the wall somewhere high, you go sin, do bad stuff, you come back home, you bow to your idol again and put it back around your neck. Well, this put a fear of God into him, though it was the wrong God at the time, that there is a God that watches you all the time. He and her did not make it together in their relationship, but he had this seed planted in him that there is a God. He did not know which God it was. Was it the God of Mohammedism? Was it the God of the Catholics? Was it the God of the Christians? But there is a God who is watching you all the time. With that seed planted in him now, that there's a God watching over you, he always had this feeling. Somebody was watching him. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When a person gets a fear of God into them, it will change their life. How sad it is that amongst many of the churches here in Thailand and amongst many of the professing Christians, there is no fear of God. They have focused so much on preaching the love of God and so much on preaching the grace of God that they forgot to preach the fear of God in the churches today. And amongst many professing Christians in Thailand, you'll find no fear of God. However, this time in, who had this Mohammedan girlfriend, 
who taught him as she went in to convert the religion of Mohammedism that their God, Allah, sees you and watches you all the time It put a fear of God into him. And he sat me down and told me his story that with this fear of God, he went to the mosque, did not find the answer. He said he went to a Catholic church and all that it was like incense and, and ring bells and speak some things he had no idea what they're even talking about. He said he went to a Christian church and the Christian church, they told him he had this fear of God and he wanted to get saved. They told him it would take two years to get saved. Now, why would a Christian church tell a lost sinner it would take him two years to get saved when the Bible says in Acts chapter 16, verse 31, Acts chapter 16, verse 31. It is written, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. With such a promise found in God's word, why would a Christian church tell a lost sinner it would take him two years to get saved? Because... In the Christian churches in Thailand, a named Thai Christian, I can say their name online, wrote a booklet, wrote in a book in the English tongue for a missionary to read on how to reach Buddhists. And they wrote in the name of Thai Christianity the story of how they reached the Buddhists was by using what's called friendship evangelism. And this Thai Christian claimed to the missionaries, the English tongue in this book about Buddhism, for missionaries, how to reach Buddhists and Buddhist countries, that you just can't preach the gospel to a Thai Buddhist. You've got to befriend them, build a relationship with them, get to know them. And this person wrote how it took them two years to lead a sinner to the Lord. By befriending this person two years, never ministering the Lord for two years, never preaching the gospel for two years, and it took them two years of building relation, building friendship to win this person to the Lord. Missionaries overseas read this book, took it as gospel truth, and then with that book together, the gospel of that belief, then they've come here and taught friendship evangelism to the ties. It started with a Thai Christian who wrote this in the book to the missionaries. Now the missionaries have brought this back into Thailand and now are teaching the Thai Christians you can't preach the gospel. And that's where though Thailand is over 99% of the population not Christian, does not profess any form of Christianity, hardly any of the less than 1% Preach the gospel. When the harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few, and if there's ever a place that needs the preach of the gospel is here in Thailand, yet most Christians do not preach the gospel as they've been taught by the missionaries who've come to their church and their Bible schools teaching them what they learned in that book from a Thai Christian. It takes two years to build a relationship, to build friendships with people, to eventually win them. And the Thai Christians taking the word of the missionaries as gospel truth. Now it's taken this that it takes two years for a person to get saved. And you've got to befriend them. You've got to build a relationship. So instead of obeying the Lord Jesus Christ to go into the world and to preach the gospel of every creature, they're busy building friendships and relationship with people, hoping that after X amount of years, they'll eventually get saved by being their friend. Years ago, I went with a group of Vietnamese refugees. They wanted a Thai church to go to. And in the area they're living in, they had a Thai church. And they asked me to go with them as I speak the Thai tongue as well for them to ask if they can have the church sanctuary maybe rent it out in the afternoon times on the Lord's Day. Went there during Sunday school, did a missionary preaching, teaching in the Thai tongue, an American missionary, and it was teaching against preaching the gospel. And he called those who preach the gospel, such as myself, who was sitting in the congregation at the time, he called us fanatics, or he said, religious crazy people, and then he said, religious crazy people are very bad. Fanatics are very bad. And all those church in the church agreed with them. And then when I went to the pastor to present these Vietnamese refugees as they used the sanctuary in the afternoon times, they kicked us out of the church. 
because they knew me from evangelists and preaching the gospel, and this missionary whose word they took as gospel truth just said that those who preached the gospel were fanatics or religious crazy people, and fanatics or religious crazy people are bad people, so they kicked me out of the church before I could even ask them if they could use the sanctuary in the afternoon time for these Vietnamese refugees who were professing Christians. You see, in Thailand, because of the missionaries, they do not preach the gospel. And they've taken this as gospel truth that it takes two years for our souls to be saved. Yes, we believe in the Word of God and the Word of God alone. But even Christians who profess such a profession, they read other books as well. And you must be careful of what other books you're reading along with the Word of God. Yes, we know the Mormons are a cult. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is founded by Joseph Smith, is a cult. We know as they add the Book of Mormon with the Bible that it's cultish, it is false, it is evil. Yet how many Christians in the Christian church take their Bibles and add other books to it? Take their Bibles and add the teachings of the teachers, the organization, with their Bible as well. Add other books with the Bible and then interpret the Bible just like the Mormons do through their other Bible books. Using those books has glasses to read the Bible through and not take God's word alone. And this young man who had a fear of God, who feared God was watching him everything he did, was desiring to be saved, went to a Christian church because he feared God. He was scared God was watching him and he grew up in this very bad slum area grew up in thievery, thief stealing, not to make a lot of money, just to be able to eat, just to be able to survive. He knew God had been watching him. He knew he was going to go to hell when he died if God's watching him. He had this fear of God. And this Christian church almost say two years. But because he comes to that slum area, if he doesn't steal, he doesn't eat. He can't find a job. He doesn't have an education. There's no job opportunities for such a one as him. And when he steals... He doesn't get a lot of money for stealing. He just gets peanuts. He sells what he steals to those who sell stolen merchandise. And they sell stolen merchandise at a very cheap price already. That's how they make their money. So he, a thief, he just makes peanuts off his stolen items he steals. Yet he has to do so just to survive, but he has this fear of God. He has this guilty conscience in doing so. And this past Wednesday night has used in the shadows of the bus stop looking for those who's going to pray, P-R-E-Y, pray upon as a predator. Behind him was a Christian. And just as he had this fear that God's watching him, he had this feeling again, somebody's watching me. He turned around and there was this Christian, this preacher of the gospel, watching him with a gospel of John to give him. That's why he jumped the way he did. That's why he sat me down to talk to me. He has been looking for somebody to help him and how to be saved from this God who is watching him all the time. And he knew that I had been watching him. That I must be sent from this God. I had been watching him. He had been caught red-handed with his hand in the cookie jar, so to speak. So he sat down and preached the gospel to him. Now, if I sat down and all I gave him was head knowledge of the gospel, it would have made none effect upon his life. If I sat him down and taught him how oh, Christ died for us, the scriptures, was buried, rose again, the dead, according the scriptures, it would do no good for him. Why does head knowledge of the gospel do you no good? You must believe the gospel. Mark chapter 1, verse 15, that is written. In Mark chapter 1, verse 15. The Lord Jesus Christ says in verse 15, And saying, the Lord Jesus Christ saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. If you do not believe the gospel, though you may repent, it will do you no good. You must repent and believe the gospel. Romans chapter 1 verse 16. In the book of Romans chapter 1 verse 16 that is written. For I am the 
ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God, the salvation, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. The gospel is the power of God, the salvation, to who? To everyone that believeth. What if a person hears this gospel, which is the power of God, the salvation, to everyone that believeth, but does not believe? agrees with his head, but does not believe with his heart, that it's not the power of God unto salvation to him. As it is written in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached that profit them, not being mixed with faith, and them that heard it. The gospel does you no profit unless it's mixed with faith to those of us who hear it. If you hear the preaching of the gospel but do not believe it, it will do you no good. If you hear the preaching of God's word but do not believe it, it will do you no good. And this is why there's so many unregenerate professing Christians today professing Christians who have not been born again, who have not experienced the power of God, the salvation, because they have yet to believe the gospel of their heart. They may agree with it with their mind. They may agree with what's being said. They may agree with what the Bible says. They may agree with about the gospel with their minds, but they do not believe it with their heart. And if they do not believe, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2, it is written, For unto us was the gospel preached was unto them, but the word preached that profit them not being mixed with faith and them that heard it. If you don't believe it, it will do you no good. If I sat down with that man on Wednesday night, this man who had to be a thief just to be able to eat, just to survive, praying upon people there on Sukhavit Road, if I just sat down with them, told them the gospel, asked them if he agreed with it, do you agree with what I preach? Well, I guess so. It sounds good. Then would you pray this prayer? You're now saved. He never would have been born again. And that's what happens with so many today. People are not preaching the gospel of those to believe it. They're preaching gospel of those that may agree with it. And if a person agrees with it and just says this prayer after them, they pronounce that person saved. But if they don't believe with their heart, that gospel will do them no good. So as I sat this man down to preach the gospel to him, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ unto him, I also gave him my testimony. You see, when I used to box, I've met many people who got in the ring had big muscles, big guys, but their punches had no effect. Their punches were heavy because they were big, but it couldn't knock anybody out. Why is that? They didn't put their body weight behind it. When I throw a punch, if I throw a left hook, 220 pounds are going to that punch. And if I throw a straight right hand because of the way my feet are, the way I use my back leg, my front leg, 222 pounds are going into that right hand. And when 200 pounds hits you on the chin, you're going to sleep. If you don't put your weight behind your punches, your punches will not knock anybody out. And there's many today who punch, who do not punch correctly, and do not put their weight behind their punches, therefore they have no knockouts. There's many who attempt to preach the gospel, and yet they get no soul saved because they have no weight behind the gospel they're preaching. They may preach from God's word and quote scriptures and scream it and yell as loud as they can, but they have no testimonies of souls getting saved, of souls being born again, because they have no weight behind their preaching. If you're preaching for somebody to believe on Jesus Christ, that they may be saved from hell when they die, and to go to heaven to spend eternity with God, and yet you yourself cannot pray for your daily bread. How are you going to persuade someone to believe in Jesus Christ to save them from hell and to save them from their sins? When Jesus Christ says in Mark chapter, Matthew chapter 6, a simple prayer, in which they today call the Lord's Prayer, a manner of which you're to pray, 
And Matthew chapter 6, verse 11, Christ says to pray for this manner, verse 11, Give us this day our daily bread. But how so few Christians actually pray this way? Now, they're not praying to God for their daily bread. They're looking to their jobs. They're looking to their salaries to provide for their daily bread. They're not trusting God to supply their needs from day to day. They're trusting their jobs. They're trusting their own selves to supply their own needs. And then they attempt to preach to others to believe on Jesus Christ to be saved. Yet they themselves don't even have enough faith to ask God for their daily bread. How they can convince a sinner to believe in Christ to save them from hell. However, on Wednesday night, because we live the gospel, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 14, once again it is written, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 14, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live the gospel, because we live of the gospel we preach. When we preach the gospel, we have weight behind our punches, so to speak. Because the gospel we preach does not come from head knowledge. It comes from our lives. And you have the test way of my life behind what I'm preaching. If what I'm preaching is not true, if what I'm preaching in God's word is not true, then I would not be able to live because I live of the gospel. The faith that I preach is not a faith I agree with with my mind, it is a faith that I live. The faith in God that I preach unto others is a faith in God that I live day to day. And as it is written in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. When I preach the gospel, we do so with faith. With what? The evidence of things not seen. You may not be able to see God with your naked eye. You may not be able to see Jesus Christ and now sits at the right hand of God with your naked eye. But we have evidence He is true. We have evidence He is real. Because when I preach, it's coming from my life. And as I testified to this young man that for 22 years, I have not worked a job. For 22 years, I have not accepted a salary. For 22 years, I have not had to ask. I have not had to beg. I have not had to hint to any others. But for 22 years, God has kept his word. And what I believe from God's word is true because the same Jesus Christ who says, Ask and you shall receive. And day by day, I prove his promise to be true because I live on his promise. We ask, we shall receive. That same Jesus Christ has promises for when we die. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. And this same Jesus Christ says, Ask, ye shall receive. As the same Jesus Christ says, if you believe in him, you should not perish but have everlasting life. And because he keeps his promises day by day, which I've seen for the past 22 years, I know he's going to keep his promise when I die. As I believe on him, I should not perish but have everlasting life. And when this young man heard that, and kept asking me about this. How does it work? How does it happen? And I continue to give them testimony after testimony after testimony how God supplies your need. Showing him in the book of John that I gave him in the Thai tongue in John chapter 14, verse 14, Jesus Christ promises. In John chapter 14, verse 14, Christ promises, if ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. And I testify this young man on Wednesday night, Christ continues to do it. He's the same yesterday, 
today and forever. And the Jesus Christ of the Bible has promised to do it here in the Bible, continues to do it today. And I continued to give him testimony after testimony of Christ still doing it, of the Lord answering our prayer. Just like in boxing, I punch, I have weight behind my punches. When I preach the gospel, there's weight behind the gospel I preach because it comes from my life. This is not something I do part-time. I live of the gospel. The gospel is my life. And if the gospel is not true, I would not be able to live. I'd have no food to eat, nowhere to stay. I'd be with nothing. And as this young man heard that, hope came to him. They didn't have to steal or rob no more. He wanted my phone number. They didn't contact with me more. So I was like, getting my phone number, pulled two mobile phones in his, from his pocket, two different styles of mobile phone. He wasn't able to turn them on. They were stolen mobile phones. That's what he does. He steal mobile phones from those that are unsuspecting. So he put the mobile phone down, and I had to write down our phone number to give to him, to ask him to keep in contact with us, and continue to exhort him as we spent an hour, almost two hours with him, exhorting him to have faith in God, to believe. Is it going to take me two years, or they say the church? No. It can happen right now if you would believe. The only thing that hindrance is you the only thing that hinders you is your lack of faith. But if you can believe, Jesus Christ says, all things are possible to him that believes. Praise the Lord. Once again, we preach the gospel from our life. And why do we preach the gospel for? Because it brings faith. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. In this faith or preaching from God's word, we live it. Everything I preach in the word of God comes from my life. That's why my preaching is filled with testimonies. As it comes from our life, we don't preach from head knowledge. We don't preach from book knowledge. We preach from our very life. We're living the faith that we're preaching. And it's very important to have this faith today because Jesus Christ says in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 18, Christ says in verse 8, Luke chapter 18, verse 8, I tell that he avenged this speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. If there's ever a time that faith is needed, it is now. In these end times we're living in, as the signs of the times are clear, Christ's return is soon. And what is Christ going to come for? Faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. When Christ walked this earth 2,000 years ago, as reading the Gospels, it was faith that pleased him. It was faith that moved him. It was faith that caused him to do miracles. And it's faith that saves and now when Christ comes again, what's going to determine if we go with him to meet him in the air? If he finds faith in our lives. Christ is looking for faith. And if there's ever a time that faith is needed in the church of Jesus Christ, it is today because so many friends and Christians don't even have enough faith to pray for their daily bread. The Christ says a prayer to this manner, give us this their daily bread. How many professing Christians do not preach the gospel? And the reason is, they actually don't believe the gospel. They're filled with doubt. How many attempt to preach the gospel, but refuse to live with the gospel, because they don't have enough faith in God? They don't supply their needs. So instead of going into all the world and preaching to us every creature, they just go down the road where they're living and say they're nice, comfortable, first world countries preaching where their job is and how long as it doesn't interfere with their job and making money because their faith is not in God supplying their need, but in a job. They have no faith that God will even answer their prayers. And when Christ comes again, what's he looking for? Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, 
shall he find faith on the earth. And this is why we preach the way we preach and even give it out for free so that others might believe. Because it's by faith that we are saved. For by grace are you saved through faith. It is faith that pleases God. Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith it is impossible to please God. And it's faith that Christ is looking for when he comes again. Let us return to the word of God in Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, verse 44. Once again, continue on with where he left off this past Lord's Day. It is written in Acts chapter 10, verse 44. While Peter had spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them, all them, which heard the word. How did the Holy Ghost fall on them which heard the word? Acts chapter 11, verse 17, verse 18. The apostle Peter rehearsed the matter says, For as much then as God gave them the light given to them to us, who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Acts 10, verse 44. How did they which heard the word receive the Holy Ghost? How the Holy Ghost fallen them which heard the word? God gave them this gift. The gift of the Holy Ghost. And why did God give them the gift of the Holy Ghost and not others? Why is it read about Cornelius and his house when they heard the apostle preaching that the Holy Ghost fell on them, yet there's others whom the apostle preached to, and the Holy Ghost did not fall on them? Because Cornelius had a foundation with his house. Acts chapter 10, verse 2, it is written of Cornelius that he was a devout man and one that feared God all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. This man and his house, they had a foundation. In order for God to give you something, in order for God to build upon your life, you must first have a foundation. If you're to build a house without a solid foundation, that house would fall apart that house would crash down, that house would be too weak, and God does not build where there is no foundation. Because Cornelius' house had this foundation, and Acts chapter 10, verse 2, God gave them the Holy Ghost. And what was this foundation they had? Cornelius was a devout man, and one that feared God all his house, which gave much alms to the people, and prayed to God always. He was a devout man. What does devout mean? Devout means faithful. Devout means loyal. This was a devout man to God. He was faithful to God. He was loyal to God because he feared God. Once again, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs chapter 1. Verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction, or the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And in Acts chapter 10, verse 2, read of Cornelius in his house. The foundation that he had was. He was a devout man and one that feared God with all his house. He was loyal to God. He was faithful to God because he feared God. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge or the beginning of wisdom. Because he feared God, he was a devout man, faithful and loyal to God. And what does this have to do with the Holy Ghost? Acts chapter 1, verse 8. To answer that question, we must ask this question, why does God give us the Holy Ghost? And then you can understand why Cornelius being faithful, loyal, or devout is the reason why God would give him the Holy Ghost. Acts 1 verse 8, Christ says, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. For what reason? So you go to church and be happy? 
but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost come upon you for what reason? So they can just feel good about yourself in church that God still loves you and His presence is so near you. That's not why He gives us the Holy Ghost. But you shall receive power the Holy Ghost come upon you so you can sing and clap your hands real loud and wave your hands in the air. That's not why God gives us the Holy Ghost. Why must we say this? Because there's many churches today, they think that's why God gives the Holy Ghost. So they may worship God, sing, clap, and make a lot of noise. So they may feel good and know that God loves just feel goosebumps all over my body. God gave me the Holy Ghost. I feel so good. God loves me. God is with me. That's not why God gives us the Holy Ghost. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost come upon you. Why? Verse 8. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, the Lord Jesus Christ, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. God gives us the Holy Ghost so we can be witnesses unto Christ, not just in our hometown, Jerusalem, not just in the neighboring cities, Judea, not just in the neighboring places, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth, the Lord endues us with power from on high so we can go into the world and preach the gospel of the creature to be a witness unto Christ into the uttermost part of the earth. Not there in the comfortable first world where you live in a nice comfortable house, have enough food to eat, and drive your nice comfortable cars, got insurance from your government, got nice hospitals to go to. That's not why God gives us power. He gives us power to come here where the gospel's needed, such as third world countries like Thailand, which 99% of the population are heading to hell, where they're so hopeless, men are selling their daughters, women are selling their bodies. Where they're so hopeless, children are thrown away in trash. That's right. They throw away their children in the trash. I remember back in 2002, I met a missionary woman, praise God, from America, was serving the Lord in the slot, in the dumps, in the dumps of Bangkok. What was she doing in the dumps? Finding children who have been thrown away in the trash, in the garbage trucks, and somehow were in the dumps, and they were still alive in the dumps. And she was rescuing these children back in 2002. When I met her, you couldn't shake her hand. She had scabies all over. And that was very contagious from rescuing these children in the dumps. Why would this American lady do so? Because her husband died in America. They were Christians, born again, lived the American life. But as her husband died, he got a glimpse of heaven before he died. And got to come back and tell all those hospital room what he saw in heaven. And how he had missed the riches of heaven because he did not give. He was a good Christian. He worked a job. He paid his tithes to the church. He did everything correct in churchianity. But in Christianity, you've got to take care of the poor. In Christianity, you've got to give to her sacrificiously. You've got to give to her. You give all the way. And he missed it. And to warn his family that he was going to have no riches in heaven, he warned them. So then his wife sold everything after he died, took all the hair, sold it, and came to serve the Lord in the dumps of Bangkok, rescuing little babies who had been thrown away in the trash because the people had these children. They have no hope. They have no faith in God. Their heathen idols did not answer their prayers, and they don't have money. This is a third world country. They may work at a factory and work a job, but it's not enough money to survive. And they get pregnant, and they give birth, and they throw their children in the trash can. This is a place that needs the gospel. This is a place that needs labors. And the Lord gives us the Holy Ghost so we can go to such a place as this, the uttermost part of the earth, to be a witness unto the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why so many professing Christians, especially in those Western nations, do not have the Holy Ghost because they're unfaithful to the Lord. If God gave them this gift of the Holy Ghost, they wouldn't go to this part of the earth. They would stay at home. They'd be more concerned about working their jobs, saving their money in the bank, living their nice, comfortable lives, and not concerned about the loss around the world, living in countries like America, which a high percent of the population already profess Christianity, have already heard the gospel time and time again, and are refused to come to places here where they're crying out, looking for the God who can answer prayer, looking for God who can save their souls. And if you're not going to be faithful to God, He's not going to give you this gift 
of the Holy Ghost. Because He only gives us the Holy Ghost that we can be witnesses unto the Lord Jesus Christ and to the uttermost part of the earth. But in Acts chapter 10, verse 2, Cornelius was not like those Western Christians I mentioned before. Cornelius was a devout man that feared God. He was so fearful of God, he was loyal. He was faithful to God. He was a devout man. And because he had this foundation to him, so that when he heard the gospel and believed on Jesus Christ, not only was he born again, but because he was a devout man, because he was a faithful man, because he was a loyal man, God gave him the Holy Ghost. That moment he heard the gospel preached and believed, he received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 10, verse 44. We have Peter spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Because God saw this man as devout, faithful, and loyal. And God could give such a one his gift, the gift of the Holy Ghost, because he would be a faithful witness of Christ in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Praise the Lord. I was born again back in 1995. It was a weekday. I got born again around this time, the sunset. Around this time, back in 1995, July of 1995, outside of a church building, based on a gospel book that I had received, I believed the Lord Jesus Christ. I repented. I threw away my idols, my strings at for price, fighting gifted by heathen witch doctors, my rap music, my worldly movies. I threw all that away, canceled all my friendships that very day, married my girlfriend, who's now my wife, that very day back in July of 1995. Praise the Lord. And then on the falling Lord's Day, I went to church. I didn't really want to go to church that Lord's Day because I'd been to church when I was 12 years old. There was nothing there. But because I was now a born-again Christian and I needed to assemble myself with other believers, as that's what born-again Christians do, I went to church that Lord's Day, not expecting much. As I went to church that Lord's Day, they began singing to the Lord because I now love the Lord. I was now born again. I began singing to the Lord as well. And as we are worshiping the Lord, I close my eyes to pray to God. We're all standing in this church singing and worshiping God. And I was praying to the Lord, telling the Lord I would just love His Word. I believe His Word. His Word's going to be my life. I'm putting all my life, all my everything on His Word. I opened my eyes and I saw a cloud. Now today, in 2017, they have smoke machines in churches that make fake clouds in the church. They have that today, shamefully speaking. But in 1995, this church I was at was a small house. It wasn't even a church building. They were meeting in a house. They didn't even have a sign. They didn't have a cross up. They are actually meeting in a house. This house was filled to capacity as we're worshiping God in this small house that they converted to a church. I saw this cloud. I didn't know what this cloud was. I had not yet read the Old Testament. Did not read about the cloud of the Lord in the Old Testament. And as this cloud slowly descended upon us, entered into me, I breathed in this cloud, and I began speaking in unknown tongues, as is written in Mark chapter 16, verse 17. Mark chapter 16, verse 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name, the name of Jesus Christ, shall they cast out devils. Praise God, they cast out devils as I believed. They shall speak with new tongues. And there in 1995, at that church, at that house in Minbury, outside of Bangkok, I received the Holy Ghost. I saw a cloud, it entered into me. I began speaking in other tongues. I was going to run away from that place. I had no idea I was going to run to. I was just going to run away. I didn't know what had happened to me. But praise God, a Christian there, an older Christian, sat me down, showed me in the Bible where this is, and explained to me I had received the Holy Ghost. You see, back in Acts chapter 10, verse 44 is written, Well, yet Peter spake these words, the Holy Ghost found them which heard the word. And then in verse 46, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnified God. 
How did they know that Cornelius' house received the Holy Ghost when they heard Peter preaching the gospel? Because they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And that's what happened to me back in 1995. I received the Holy Ghost and began speaking with other tongues. Just like what happened to Cornelius here back in Acts chapter 10, verse 44, and in verse 46, the Holy Ghost found them and heard the word, verse 46, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Praise the Lord. And ever since then, I've been a witness unto Christ to the outermost parts of of this earth, here especially, in this heathen man traveling all over this country, places that times have not even been to, as a witness in the Jesus Christ, because God gave me the Holy Ghost. And why did God give Cornelius Holy Ghost? Because he was a devout man, because he was a faithful man, because he was a loyal man. Acts of 10, verse 2, Cornelius was a devout man, one that feared God, with all his house. And why does God give you the Holy Ghost today? If you're faithful. If you're going to be a faithful witness to Christ. If you're going to be a loyal witness to Christ. Then God will give you this gift of the Holy Ghost. There are many Christian Christians who claim that Holy Ghost. But they don't really have him. I remember back preaching in Hawaii. Back at the Holy Eve Evangelical Mission. And the late pastor, Edward Fujinaga, was in his 70s at the time. He was rebuking that church there, telling them, you guys don't know the Holy Ghost. He said, we had the Holy Ghost back in the old days. You young generation, you don't know the Holy Ghost. And how so true that is of many churches around the world today. They may claim they have the Holy Ghost. They may try to act like the Holy Ghost, that they have the Holy Ghost. But they, in fact, do not have this gift. God has not given this gift to them. The gift of the Holy Ghost. And why is that? Well, you look at why did God give it to Cornelius' house? He gave it to Cornelius' house because he was a devout man. There's a lack of devotion in churches today. There's a lack of loyalty in the churches today. There's a lack of faithfulness in the churches today. If you desire to be a witness to Christ, if you desire that your life is for Christ, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain, if you desire to give your all, your 100% to Jesus Christ, to be a witness him around the world, it does not matter what church you go to. It does not matter what denomination you belong to. If you have this desire to be a witness unto Christ, to give the Lord 100%, to be devout, loyal, and faithful to the Lord, God will give you the Holy Ghost if you believe. For Jesus Christ says, there should be nothing impossible to him that believeth. All things are possible to him that believes. And if you believe, and if you're loyal to the Lord, and if you give the Lord 100% that Christ is not going to be your religion, Christ is going to be your life. That the gospel is not going to be something you do on the part time, that gospel is going to be your life. That God will give you this light gift, the gift of the Holy Ghost. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Thy faithfulness and always answer our prayers and give unto us our heart's desires. And as for us to live as Christ, to die as gain, as our heart's desires, to be filled with Thy Holy Ghost, to be endued with power from on high, to be witnesses unto Thy Holy Child, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise the Lord.